Hi, and welcome back to my Digital Integrated Circuits course at bar -Ilan University. I'm Dr. Adam Tiemann of the Enix Labs, and today we're going to go over Lecture 6, which is about interconnect. So we have five parts of this. We're going to start with the first glance at interconnect, then go over capacitance, resistance, interconnect modeling, and finally, wire scaling. So let's start with the first glance at interconnect. So what is the wire? We usually take a schematic view that has these inverters over here and these wires over here that connect to their fan out and so forth. And we just, uh, these are the transmitters, these are the receivers. We just use these as an equipotential type of a perfect wire ideal type of thing. But actually when we make a physical realization, and this is only looking at a single metal layer, we see that these actually have height, width, spacing between them and so forth. So therefore, if we want to go and make a model of this, each piece of the wire has a, a, a resistive, a capacitive, and an inductant um, part to it. And so we have to show the resistance, capacitance, and, and inductance of each piece of these wires, plus the, the, the coupling capacitance between the wires. So we get this all-inclusive model. This is often pretty complex to uh, deal with. So what we do and what is the main effect, uh, at least traditionally in VLSI, is just looking at the capacitance. So we use a, an, an all capacitance model where we just have the capacitance of each wire that we relate, uh, we lump it and relate it to ground, plus the coupling capacitance between the wires. And these parasitics, or these uh, parasitic parts of this, the, the interconnect, they have a lot of uh, implications um, on all the metrics you care about. They have uh, an effect on reliability, performance, power consumption, and cost. And when we look at the classes of parasitics, we usually start with the capacitive. That's the most important one, usually in VLSI. And then the resistive, and finally inductive, which we actually won't be discussing much in, in, this, uh, in this lecture series. So looking at modern interconnect, uh, there's this nice picture on the left where um, they etched away all of the interlayer dielectrics between uh, the, the different metal layers. And you can see the metal layers like metal one and with the vias that go up to metal two and the vias that go up to metal three and so forth. And, and this is a very cool and complex um, structure, kind of like a really complex interchange on the highway and so forth. Um, and it, it's really nice. If we want to look at a, a newer type of a, a metal stack, we see that this is a cross-section of an Intel, Intel 10 nanometer interconnect stack, and you see that it's quite complex with a lot of metal layers and so forth, and we'll be discussing how that works. So that leads us to our first um, category of uh, parasitics, which is capacitance, which as I mentioned is the most important usually when we're discussing VLSI. So um, if we take two inverters that are driving each other, this is the first inverter, okay, and this is the second inverter, what we um, saw in previous courses, there are all these uh, parasitic um, capacitances that the devices have themselves, and it gets quite complex with these uh, CGDN, CGPN, CGSN, etc., etc. Um, and we also have now what we're saying is we have this uh, the parasitic of the wire that connects them and we just called it up till now C wire and maybe we gave it as a, as a constant. Um, in fact what we often do is we take all these output capacitances and the C wire and the input capacitances to the next stage and so forth and we just lump them all together and make this simplified model where we have our inverter with some sort of equivalent C load that it drives and that makes uh, dealing with it and handle analysis and so forth much more uh, convenient and simple. So that's a simplified model that we've been using pretty much until now and we usually do like to do when we discuss it, but that's not the whole story. So let's try to go into how we model the real um, parasitics or the capacitive parasitics of the interconnect and we'll start with the traditional parallel plate model. So the parallel plate model looks at a um, some sort of a, an inductor um, such as uh, this piece of metal here that is uh, is much 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 wider and bigger than actually the distance of the other plate. So we have the substrate here and we have some metal layer say metal one or a poly layer that's running on top of it and if the distance here, this what we call here TDI in this uh, in, in this uh, schematic, is much 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 smaller than the width here, the W or the W times L. Then we can say it's a, it's an infinite um, parallel plate. It's an infinite plate, and we can say that the whole capacitance is just these field lines over here that make up the capacitance. And um, if we look at that, then uh, the the size of a parallel plate capacitor, which you probably saw in some like uh, early physics course is uh, the C parallel plate is going to be the dielectric um, permittivity divided by the distance between the two plates 
times the um, the surface area. So the width of the capacitor times the length of the capacitor. And that's uh, traditionally how we used to look at wires. Um, and typical numbers for this, which we would usually take, if we take gate capped, which um, we I don't know if we said it before, but as a rule of thumb, it was about 2 femtofarad per micron, and diffusion cap was also about 2 femtofarad per micron. Well, the wire cap, if we take a minimum size wire, would be about 0.2 femtofarad per micron, um, which seems to be smaller than the gate and diffusion cap, but, but remember the wires can uh, have a, a lot larger area than, uh, uh, than what the gates and the diffusions take up. So the question is, how can we reduce this capacitance? And obviously, when we look at the, um, the formula over here, well, we can either um, reduce the permittivity, um, we can uh, make the distance larger, or we can reduce the area. I think that reducing the area is not a, as large an option because we still need to uh, move the current from place to place, and uh, that depends on our whole floor plan of our chip and so forth. Um, uh, making the distance larger, well, that's going to happen if we stack up the metals and go um, uh, higher and higher, but we'll see that actually, due to scaling, we get um, wires that are closer together, and so that's also not exactly something that we can, uh, th that we can um, improve. But what about permittivity? So if we look at permittivity of materials, um, we usually are talking about silicon dioxide. That's our common interlayer dielectric, right, our ILD. Um, and it's 3.9, and that's not the best we can get. In fact, um, the best permittivity we can get if we're going down is going to be one for free space. So going this way, we get what we call a low K dielectric. Okay, K coming from the same thing that we discussed, high K as the transconductance of the capacitor. So K has this, uh, the epsilon inside, and that's why we call it a low K material. Remember that for gate capacitance, this is going to be for interconnect, right? Uh, for gate capacitance, we saw that we're going to want to do high K materials. Um, that's gate cap. Uh, so we're going the exact opposite direction. Try not to get confused with that. So the thing is, is there anything that's in between this uh, silicon dioxide and free space? And the answer is yes. Um, low K materials have been uh, introduced to VLSI processes since about uh, 90 nanometers or so. And they're commonly used today, um, going into different types of uh, improvements to get the, the permittivity as low as possible and therefore reduce the, uh, uh, the capacitive coupling between uh, materials. Uh, in fact, I thought this is really cool because I had discussed it for many years as something that was maybe impossible. But um, already in uh, the 14 nanometers of Intel, they have implemented air gaps that sit in these interlayer dielectrics and give us this real, real, real low permittivity close to one. Um, and this is something that is done in uh, important parts of chips nowadays. Okay, but. Um, Parallel plate capacitance, as I said, it um, relies on the fact that we have this uh, infinite size parallel plate. Um, is that so? So if we look at the, the uh, type of wire, it doesn't only have these, um, these uh, uh, field lines over here. It also has field lines from the side that go to the other plate. And these we call fringe because the sides are the fringes. Okay, so we have two sides and they have fields that go to the other plate and they cause capacitance as well. Um, and so it, it could be from anywhere actually along the, uh, the, uh, the, the conductor. So uh, a general model, like a simplified model that could be used in an early physics class would be we take a parallel plate and we take a, um, an infinite um, cylinder and uh, we've developed in type of early physics course what the capacitance of an infinite cylinder is. So you can assume that this cylinder kind of is over here and over here. Then we say the size, uh, the width is actually going to be um, the width of the original capacitor, uh, the original wire, minus uh, half of the size for each side. So that kind of shows, I guess, what um, like uh, if we had half a diameter over here is. And here we have the fringing uh, type of uh, field lines, and here we have the parallel plate lines. And that brings us to this uh, kind of simple model that the capacitance um, per uh, millimeter of length would be the parallel plate plus the fringe capacitance, where the parallel plate is, again, the size of the capacitor, uh, the area times uh, epsilon over t, um, where the, the, the width is w minus h over 2, as I show here. And we have to, times, uh, to multiply it by the length to get the capacitance. Plus, this is the um, uh, formula for an infinite cylinder. And again, we have to, time, uh, the, we have to multiply it by the length. Um, 
so that's kind of a, a, a simplified model for printing capacitance that at least used to be used. Um, it, it, we'll see in a little bit that it's kind of far from accurate nowadays. Um, but there's something that's very important about this with fringing versus barrel plate. So again, if in the past we, we would think that this is a kind of our capacitor that's sitting on top of a substrate and this was really infinite and so we had all these uh, capacitive parts over here and this fringe was almost nothing. Well, what has happened over the years is that our um, our, we've uh, scaled the sizes so these guys get like uh, thinner and taller and we'll discuss in scaling why and actually the uh, uh, these uh, uh, conductors they look something like this nowadays so really this uh, these types of field lines are very small and these would be actually um, rather large it even gets worse than that because now if we go up to another metal layer the length over here the TDI becomes really large and the actual capacitance to ground from a from a, a metal 10 or something that's really high is going to be very low on the other hand when we take uh, two um, types of uh, uh, of these um, conductors and put them next to each other with a minimum spacing we're going to have a, a ton of these maybe parallel plate type of field uh, uh, a field between the two uh, uh, between the two uh, uh, wires here, and so this cap uh, coupling is going to be much larger than anything else. Uh, however, what we uh, do usually do as a, can take as a kind of a, a, a rule of thumb, just to kind of think about it, we can take the, the fringe capacitance per edge, because again, the fringe. Uh, we have one edge and two edge, they both give fringe. It's about 0.05 femtofarad per micron. And um, uh, another thing is that the, the coefficients that give us the fringe capacitance, they're going to be given per micron because it doesn't matter what the width of the actual um, conductor is. It just matters what the length is to make the fringe bigger. But on the other hand, with uh, the parallel plate, it matters both the uh, width and the length. So these are going to be given uh, in uh, per micron squared. So if we take that, we can take a simple model which uh, was previously used and maybe is not as popular nowadays. Um, for example, in the 25, um, in the 0.25 micron process that's used in the in the Rabbi textbook, um, we can uh, take something like uh, a table like this that would have been found in inside the model uh, for the technology and you see that there'll be two numbers which uh, cross between the different layers so if we want to look for example what the capacitance between the field which is would be the substrate without a, an active area and a poly layer the the gate layer we would get two numbers the first one would be given in amptofarad per micrometer square the second in amptofarad per micrometer so obviously this is fringe and uh, this one would be a uh, parallel plate, okay? And then we use the model we had before over there where uh, the wire is a parallel plate times W times L. Um, so that's this uh, uh, amptofarad uh, per millimeter square. Um, and two times the fringe, which would be this one, times the length. And we, we have to take it between every two metals. Look what the actual um, overlap between them is. And, uh, and that's how can we can get our uh, modeling. And an extraction tool uh, such as Caliber or Star XT or QRC will do this in a much more... Um, a much more accurate way and count how what the overlap is and multiply it by these coefficients. So you can see that it, it's it's much more complex nowadays than just looking at the capacitance to ground. In fact, the interwire capacitance has gotten much worse than the capacitance to ground. And if we see, if we take some sort of a uh, model here that has a metal layer uh, with a metal layer underneath and one above, and there's some sort of distance between these two metal layers, but they also have metals in the same layer um, that are next to each other, and this distance keeps getting smaller due to scaling, um, what we can see here is that the line to ground, which is this green, as we've scaled the, the, the width, um, this has gotten to be small and uh, versus the line to line, which is uh, all of these guys, has uh, grown larger as we scale the space. Um, and in fact, in the past, maybe when we had large spaces, the total capacitance used to be the line to ground. But um, nowadays, it's pretty much the total capacitance from line to ground is almost negligible compared to the capacitance uh, um, to the other wires. So how does this affect us as designers? Well, we can look at uh, um, several types of uh, effects it has, but one of them is, is kind of noise or signal integrity that we have uh, due to coupling capacitance. So if we take a, a bunch of uh, 
drivers here and uh, one receiver and we're only looking at this middle type of a path this is the path that we're going through and we want to see what the uh, delay is through this guy this is our like device under test um, and if we have each of them uh, getting a, a rising edge uh, step at, uh, the, at the input to these guys what's going to happen is um, that uh, at the output they're all going to have a falling step and if we look at the b uh, at t equals zero at the beginning of the operation this is at vdd and this is at vdd and this is at vdd and therefore the um, the voltage drop on this capacitor at t equals zero is going to be zero and if we look at it afterwards is zero zero and zero so the voltage drop afterwards is going to be zero um, what that means is, in effect, these capacitances don't come into play at all in this type of a uh, in this type of calculation, and this is the only capacitance that is actually relevant to uh, affect the, the 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 RC that this uh, guy sees. So um, what we can do is write that the, that our total effective capacitance in this case, when the transitions are similar between um, the coupled uh, uh, drivers and the actual driver. Um, we, we can cancel out these capacitors and the effective capacitance is only the load that uh, the regular load to that we lump to ground um, that's seen by the, the middle guy. However, what would happen if we'd have uh, um, a more, I guess, common case where the other guys were not toggling, so they were keeping steady. And um, in this case, this is going to be a VDD, right, the whole time. And this is going to be a VDD the whole time. And um, if we look, uh, this is going to be a VDD at the beginning, and this is going to be a ground at the end. So at the beginning, there is going to be um, zero uh, on these uh, zero volts on these uh, capacitors and at the end we're going to have VDD on these capacitors um, so basically these capacitors made a full transition similar to the load so that means that uh, when we're calculating this the effective load is um, this C load but plus we have the full um, uh, value of this capacitor plus the full value of this capacitor so the total load is going to be CL plus CC1 plus CC2 and the third case is going to be when we make opposite transitions so now the middle one the DUT is rising where, whereas the, um, the, the, the neighbors are falling and that means at the beginning here this was zero and this was VDD Right, and this was zero. So what that means is that we actually have a, um, uh, a voltage this way a VDD on uh, these two capacitors. And at t equals one, we're going to have VDD here and zero here and VDD here. And that means we're going to have um, actually a voltage drop of VDD the opposite way. And this plus this is two VDD. So that means we're actually, in essence, we have to change the amount of charge. Um, in the in each of these capacitors double what we had before or the value of the capacitor is effectively doubled So that means our total capacitance is going to be our C load which makes one swing from zero to VDD but plus um, CC1 and CC2 are going to be doubled so that means it's a much worse effect of noise So that's something that's very important to pay attention to and we'll see it in a, a, a When we talk about timing um, in this course or in my digital VLSI design course when we talk about signal integrity um, another thing that we can see with uh, how uh, how coupling signals affect us is uh, we can take a, an example like this. So we take a pair of wires over here. Each of them have a capacitance to ground. So this has five picofarad to ground. This is five picofarad to ground. This is pretty big for a wire. Usually we're going to be talking in femtofarad, so several orders of magnitude smaller than that. And there's some coupling capacitance between them, which is one picofarad. So it's about 20% of what we see in these uh, capacitance to ground. And uh, what we're going to do is we're going to connect a, a square pulse to one of the wires so we're going to drive this guy to 1.8 volts but due to the coupling it um, this guy is going to also be have some sort of a uh, jump uh, due to the coupling so the question is how high will the noise pulse because this is not supposed to change um, how high will the noise pulse be and in this case this wire is floating so the the, the voltage is going to jump and it's just going to stay there so how do we figure that out well we draw an equivalent circuit Okay, so we have our voltage source over here, which is connected to line one, and line one over here, it has its capacitance, it's five picofarad to ground. Okay, then line one and line two are connected through this coupling cap, okay, which is one picofarad, and then line two is also connected to ground at five picofarad, and then we can just use a capacitive divider. So the uh, uh, this VC2 is going to be V in, which is 1.8 volt, times the coupling capacitance divided by the coupling capacitance plus C2, and that comes out 0.3 volts. So um, we're going to get uh, quite a big rise over here, which is not 
that huge because the relative size of this versus this is not as big. But if they were um, equal, we would have a 50% rise, in, et cetera. So looking at that, if we take, again, this type of a, a setup where we have this um, driver that has some sort of a... Uh, uh, um, uh, a transition on it and it's going to be rising due to the coupling capacitance over here it's going to cause an effect on this guy so this is the aggressor and this is the victim and if we look at how it's affected by how large this driver is so this is the aggressor the guy in red over here that rises um, and if the victim is undriven well do because the coupling capacitance is the same size uh, or the uh, as, as the victim's uh, capacitance to ground we're going to have a 50 percent rise eventually on the undriven guy it's just going to stay there but because there is when when there is a driver that's actually holding it to ground it really depends on the size of the driver so if it's a half size driver we get quite a big jump before it discharges back to ground if we have a double sized driver we made this guy really really big then it's going to have a, a small jump so the uh, uh, bottom line is that if we want to uh, reduce the noise what we should do is we should drive um, coupled wires uh, with a large enough driver so they're not as effective as another pointing point about this we have uh, what's known as shielding and shielding is a way to uh, protect important lines so let's say we have a clock for example or um, or an analog net that has to be really um, uh, really well taken care of and we don't want it to be a victim and to be affected by noise with a clock also because the clocks have strong transitions and strong drivers they're going to be aggressors to others so when we want to protect something what we can do is um, we can shield it we can put another wire in the middle so here we have the aggressor let's say this is a um, let's say this is a, a some sort of a signal and this is an analog signal or a clock what we're going to do is we're going to put a wire in the middle that's going to really block all the field lines that go between them okay um, uh, another way that uh, costs a bit less because this also has capacitance and maybe it has uh, more spacing on it is to um, to put just extra spacing between the aggressor and the victim um, we can see this that it's usually done uh, on a similar layer um, and the reason for that is because as I showed before the spacing between uh, metals has gone down where the aspect ratio has gone up so we, we would really want to field uh, shield these capacitances but it can also be done on layers uh, above and below another thing that's done is we usually use Manhattan routing which means one metal layer is going to be routed uh, vertically the other layer is going to be routed horizontally and then the overlap between them is really small so we'll have something like a metal 2 going up and down and a metal 3 going right and left Uh, final point uh, I kind of want to talk about here, it, it has nothing to do with interconnect per se, but it does have to do with parasitics and capacitances. So if you uh, went in a, in a type of a simulation and you saw some sort of a strange noise pulse, so you put, um, you, you put an inverter over here and you went and you uh, gave it like a, um, a uh, step input at the, at the input, what you would have seen probably at the output is at the beginning it would have been at VDD. Okay, and at the end it would have obviously been a ground, but instead of just seeing a regular type of a step uh, of a uh, RC kind of a, uh, discharge, we would have seen a step over here and then the RC discharge, and this gets up to VDD plus some sort of delta, and that kind of looks like some sort of error. Well, is it really? Um, and the answer is no. Remember that we have in our um, inverter over here, and basically any type of CMOS gate, what we're going to have is we're going to have some feed through cap that's going to go from the gate to the uh, to the drains of these uh, guys and uh, and when we do this uh, rise on the on the input um, the the connection over here is going to cause a voltage jump on the output how big is it going to be well it depends on how big the capacitance uh, is of the load if it, the capacitance is larger here uh, as compared to here this this uh, jump is going to be smaller but it for sure is going to happen so um, that is not a mistake it is a feature um, and it's called feed through cap and we have to be uh, we have to know that it happens and, and be aware of it final thing is how do we measure um, the capacitance of some sort of a, a, of a test setup like how do we know what the uh, gate capacitance is of a of a transistor well one way to set it up is to use what we saw as a fan out for type of a um, uh, type of a measurement before so we can take a, a first guy that's uh, connected to a voltage pulse right and then uh, that drives what we call the DUT 
Okay, so we're going to measure TPD over here. And what we're going to do here is put our um, type of a load over here. So for example, if we want, I mean, I'm going to write that, draw this as a black box. Okay. And uh, in our black box right now, we're going to check the gate capacitance of a transistor. So I can take a transistor over here and connect everything to ground. And I'm going to be uh, checking out what this C load or what the C gate of this uh, this guy is um, and now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna uh, have another measurement that's right next to it and so again I'm gonna have uh, this type of a voltage pulse over here I'm gonna have this this guy this is uh, for shaping the transition shaping transition right we're always gonna use this in our um, in our simulations okay um, and we're gonna have our DUT over here Oh, this is our reference DUT, I guess we would call it. And for this, we're going to connect a capacitor to it, and the capacitor is going to be a changing capacitor. And we're going to change the level of this until we find the, the C um, the C cap over here that's equal to the C DUT. And when C cap equals, I mean, excuse me, when TPD of our DUT equals uh, TPD of our ref, then uh, that means that uh, C, uh, uh, C DUT equals C cap. Okay, so that's a way of measuring capacitance. We can do the same thing with, for example, a diffusion capacitance, something like that. We'll connect here. We can do it with a whole inverter that we put in there and so forth to measure the capacitances of them. So a uh, last point is uh, in this chapter of our lesson is about the computer hall of fame and today we wanted to discuss the first computer or maybe not the first computer and that is the ENIAC the electronic numerical integrator and calculator and this was a very famous machine with 20,000 vacuum tubes 1500 relays 10,000 capacitors 70,000 resistors um, it took up a, a mere 200 kilowatts of power it weighed a mere 30 tons and it cost in the, when it came out uh, only 500 thousand um, dollars which probably nowadays would be 50 million or more I'm not sure um, so it was completed in 1946 at the University of Pennsylvania by John Eckert and John Matchley and it was used to calculate artillery firing tables for the US Army's ballistic research laboratory however why did I ask if it's the first computer or not and we discussed this in a previous computer Hall of Fame because it lost the patent for being the first computer in 1973 to the ace um, because the ace came out before but it was the first general purpose uh, programmable computer and it's uh, famous in lore for being that of course there's also uh, Turing's machines that he developed that were secret during World War II so um, that's less known about and possibly come before the ENIAC but for many years and uh, often today ENIAC is considered the first computer